Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Joanne Baird, uh, Director of the Department of Education, and I'm really pleased to be hosting um, the seminar this evening. This is a, a seminar that we've had to um, postpone due to technical difficulties when we, we tried to run it a couple of weeks ago. So you'll be pleased to know that we've had a trial and everything is working as it should be. It's a great relief to all of us. I'm absolutely delighted to have Montserrat Gomendio speak for us this evening. Um, she's currently working at the Spanish Research Council in Madrid, um, but she has a stellar career and was previously Secretary of State for Education, Vocational Training and Universities at the Spanish Ministry of Education, Culture and Sports. And she also worked at OECD um, between 2015 and 2019. Um, as head of the OECD Centre for Skills when it was created in 2017. Um, she's going to be talking to us about um, international tests and also uh, the effect that they have um, in Spain. And it's really interesting for me to hear about her work because I know so little about the assessment system in Spain and have found it quite hard to find this in the literature. So um, I'm absolutely fascinated to hear about her um, expertise and experiences with these um, issues that we, we know so little about. We're going to have, um, we're going to use the chat function um, on Zoom so if you have a, a question, the Q&A, sorry, if you have a question, um, please register it there. And we'll come to the questions at the end um, of the session. But um, once that's going to speak for about 45 minutes and that will give us some time at the end um, for our discussion then. So with no further ado, I shall hand over to you, um, once Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. So thank you very much, Joanne, for the invitation. <clears throat> I'm really pleased to be here today and to explain a little bit about the Spanish system and um, what uh, international surveys, uh, including PISA, say or do not say about, about the system, and also explain a little bit about uh, the assessments. But basically, the bottom line is that it's a bit difficult to understand because there are no proper national assessments. Uh, but I, I will explain that in a minute. I'll just try to get my PPT started. Can you see it properly? Yeah, okay. Um, so the reason why why the title is what do international large scale assessments say or fail to say about the spanish education system why why all the fuss is because um, all international large scale assessments but in particular pisa has a mu huge media impact uh, in spain much much higher than in in most other participating countries as we can see here, these are headlines from PISA 2012 and from PISA 2015. Uh, this has nothing to do with a PISA shock in the sense that uh, the results for Spain um, have been below OECD average and stagnated over time since Spain joined PISA in 2000. So, when you have countries with a lot of media impact, like Germany, it's because the results are worse than the country expected, and therefore the country reacts and does something about it. In Spain, that's not the case, I'm afraid. Uh, as I will show, the results have been below OECD average for most cycles, huge media impact, but no reaction. And the reason for this, as you can see in the in the second headline, is that uh, PISA claims, um, I think this is from 2015, but it's again been consistent across cycles, that it's uh, a country that is very high on equity. Uh, so PISA has contributed to this legend that the Spanish education system 
uh, has sacrificed quality uh, because the priority is to achieve equity. And I will try to explain uh, that this is a mistake and, and this is not the case. And then in the third uh, headline, you can see uh, Spain repeats grade, which makes reference to the fact that grade repetition is very high in, in the Spanish education system. And again, I, I will try to explain why I think that's the case. So as I said, there are no proper uh, national uh, assessments in Spain, uh, nor are there regional assessments with uh, common standards uh, among regions. So PISA really is the only metric that uh, we can use in Spain, not only to compare ourselves to other countries, but to try to understand trends over time and also to compare regions. Uh, so there's been a lot of attention in the last PISA cycles about the fact that PISA shows great regional inequalities. This is one of the uh, consequences of not having uh, national assessments, that regions are diverging more and more to the extent that the most uh, high performing regions, according to PISA, are uh, performing so much better than uh, the worst performing regions that the difference between them is equivalent to at least uh, a year and a half of schooling. So these are huge differences uh, within the country. So I will uh, present data from the three major international surveys from TIMS, with it, which is uh, Trends in International Maths and, and Science, PEARLS, uh, which is Progress in International Leading, uh, Reading Literacy Study, and then uh, the survey from the OECD, which is PISA, uh, that looks at uh, the, the three domains in the same survey. So it also looks at reading, maths, and science. Now, um, I think the main difference uh, between them has to do first with, with the grades. Uh, TIMS uh, analyzes grades uh, fourth and, and eighth. Pearls uh, surveys uh, students in, in fourth grade, um, and PISA looks at 15 year olds. Uh, so the main difference is that teams and Pearls look at all students in a classroom belonging to the same grade, while PISA looks at 15 year olds. Now in some countries, this may not make such a big difference, but in a country like Spain, where as I have explained, uh, we have very high rates of great repetition. This makes a huge difference because you have quite a, a small proportion between 60 and 70 percent of the 15 year olds in the model grade, in the grade where they're supposed to be studying. And depending on whether they have repeated grade once or twice, uh, they are in, in lower grades. So you're, you're actually uh, assessing students that are studying in, in different grades. Uh, rather than students in the same classrooms like uh, the, the first two surveys. Um, now, PISA also claims uh, to uh, be uh, particularly oriented towards identifying good uh, practices in education and has a big impact in shaping uh, the narrative around education policies. Teams and pearls are designed to measure whether students learn what they have in the curriculum. PISA is designed in such a way that it doesn't analyze the curriculum, rather it analyzes where the students have the knowledge and skills that PISA experts uh, think are important to solve uh, problems in, in everyday life. So what do they tell us about Spain? Uh, I will start with the findings from PISA 2015, because I, as I will explain later, the, the results for PISA 2018 were withdrawn. So this is the typical PISA ranking where you can see that there are huge differences between uh, participating countries. Uh, this uh, on, on top, you have uh, mostly countries from East Asia, that are, have become the top performers in, in PISA, but also other countries like Estonia, which uh, emerged as a top performer in PISA 2015. You can see that Spain uh, in 2015 did reach the OECD average rather than being below the OECD average. And then as you can see, there are many countries below uh, the OECD average. And as PISA expands and more and more 
low and middle income countries join PISA, you get more and more countries that are low performers according to PISA. I stress this because I think it has to do with the changes that PISA implemented in, in 2018, which led to unreliable results in Spain and the withdrawal of, of the data. Now, PISA, uh, if you compare the, the findings for those countries that have participated in PISA 2012 and PISA 2015, the last uh, two cycles, or uh, those countries that have participated for more cycles before 2012, and you compare the results in science, what you can see in this figure is that most countries are in the middle in light blue. So according to PISA, most countries show no improvements or declines in science over time. So in other words, most countries are stagnated. On the left-hand side, you have a few countries that have improved uh, over cycles. Uh, most of them, except for Singapore, are low performing countries that have improved uh, over time. And in the right hand side, you have uh, those countries that have declined over time, according to PISA. Again, some of them are low performers, but others like Finland are, were top performers in 2000 and have declined in their performance ever since. So the main message from this slide is according to PISA, despite increases in, in investment, uh, PISA started in 2000, so we're talking uh, 15 years since I'm presenting data up to 2015. Over 15 years, there have been increases in investment, there have been many reforms, and still, according to PISA, in most participating countries, there has been no significant change. So the main message is uh, countries are stagnated, they are not improving. Here, this is um, um, a... Uh, two-dimensional uh, graph from PISA, which shows countries depending on whether they are above uh, the OECD average in performance and uh, above or below the OECD average in equity. Now, the, the square on the upper right-hand side is the square where most countries would want to be. Uh, those are top performers, both in quality and equity. But as you can see, only a few countries manage that. And uh, the square on the bottom left-hand side is where no country would want to be uh, because uh, they are low performers and they also uh, fare badly in terms of uh, equity. As you can see, as I said, Spain in 2015 did reach the OECD average in um, levels of performance in quality. Uh, but it's slightly below uh, the OECD average in terms of equity. And still, there is this legend that uh, the Spanish system has sacrificed uh, quality for the sake of equity, uh, which, as I will show, but this graph shows too, uh, is not the case. Uh, this is uh, just to show that in all countries uh, that participate in PISA, there is a strong impact of socioeconomic background on student performance. Uh, but um, you can see that in uh, countries with uh, good quality education systems, although there's still a, an impact of family background, you get all students independently of the socioeconomic background improving. And this leads to uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds in countries with good quality education systems, this is the left-hand side of the graph, having better levels of performance than uh, kids from privileged backgrounds in countries where the education system is of poor quality, which are the countries that you see on the left-hand side. So the main findings, I think, uh, from this uh, piece of data are that there are major differences in student performance between countries, which are equivalent to several years of schooling. So I think these international surveys have been really important in putting a lot of emphasis on quality, showing to what extent differences between uh, countries in terms of quality are huge uh, in PISA 2015 the difference between the top performer and the lowest performing country was equivalent of seven years of schooling. So we're talking huge differences here. And I think it, uh, it's been very important because it has shifted the debate 
from uh, looking only at inputs, amount of investment, to looking at the outcomes. Uh, what are the levels of, of student performance in different countries? Uh, PISA claims that there are no major changes over time, despite increases in spending and many education reforms. It also shows that excellence and equity are non-exclusive, but only a handful of countries have achieved both. And it shows that socioeconomic background always has an impact on student performance. So what are the data for Spain? So these are the data, um, as I explained, uh, since 2000, um, when uh, PISA, uh, Spain joined PISA, and it has uh, participated in every uh, cycle since uh, 2000. And what you can see mainly in reading, uh, sorry, in science and maths, is that it started by performing uh, slightly below the OECD average, and basically, it has remained stagnated over time, although uh, there has been uh, some improvement in, in 2015. Now, in reading, there seems to be uh, a decline in, in 2006. I can explain that later because um, I think it's a technicality. But if you look at the first cycle in 2000 and you compare it with 2015, uh, there has been no significant improvement. So again, Spain below OECD average and stagnated uh, over time. It did breach uh, the OECD average in 2015 due to a combination of improvements in Spain and declines in the OECD average. And the main reason why Spain uh, normally performs below OECD average is that uh, it has very few top performers. Uh, it has a similar share of low performing students than the OECD average, but it has a really small uh, percentage of top performing students. And therefore the variation between students, it's not as large as in other countries because there are so few top performing students. And this is what PISA refers to, this flatness is what PISA refers to as pain being high on equity. And I think this is misleading because it just means that students are more similar to each other because we don't have top performing students uh, to the same extent that other countries do. And this is a seemingly complicated graph, but the only thing uh, that you have to look at, you have Spain with, a, with the arrow. Uh, on the top, uh, you have the top performing students. You can see that Spain has a much lower percentage of top performing students than other participating countries in PISA. And on the bottom in red, you have the low performing students. And there you see that Spain has a similar percentage of top low performing students. So what do the other two surveys tell us? Uh, as I explained, PEARLS uh, assesses reading and TIMS assesses maths and, and science in a different way, uh, looking at uh, students in the same grade. And Spain has not participated in as many cycles as it has in PISA. So we can only compare 2011 with 2015 for TIMS and uh, 2011 and 2016 for teams. By the way, uh, tomorrow they're releasing the results for teams. So we'll see um, what, what findings we, we get there. But basically, uh, Spain in Spain, we participate only for students in the fourth grade. This is primary. And here, at least among students in primary, you can see a much greater improvement over time than uh, we, we saw with PISA. So this might have to do with the fact that an education reform was approved in 2013 and by 2015 it had been implemented in primary but not in secondary or it could have with differences in sensitivity between PISA and PEARLS and teams in the extent to which they are able to detect uh, changes over time. So as I said at the beginning, uh, Spain is the only uh, common metric that we have in the, in the country. So it's used very often uh, to look at regional differences. And we find that there are major uh, differences between regions. So here, what you have is the average for Spain in red. Uh, this is for 2015, when Spain had a similar uh, level of performance than the OECD average, which is next to it. And then you have uh, all the regions, because in Spain, all the regions have an extended sample. 
So we have a, a statistically significant sample for all 17 regions. And next to each region, you have the country that the region is most similar to. So basically what you can see is that the, oh, the average for the country is not very meaningful because it actually is hiding huge differences between uh, regions. Some of the regions are performing as well as top performing countries in PISA and other regions are performing very poorly uh, like low performing countries in PISA. Now, these are uh, different levels of student performance in PISA, and this is just to make the point again that the main problem with the Spanish education system and the reason why it doesn't perform as well as other education systems is uh, that it doesn't have a, a large share of top performers. And um, it, it, as a country, it doesn't have a lower, uh, a different share of low performers than other countries. But if you look at the regions and the differences between them, you see that the low performing regions at the bottom do have a very large share of very low performing students. These are students below level two, which according to PISA are illiter functionally illiterate in, in numeracy and, and reading. And you have over 25% of the students in that range. Now, differences in, 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 in wealth uh, between the different regions do explain uh, a large uh, share of the variance in, in student performance when you compare regions, but still you get clear outliers. So you get some regions that are performing much better than would be expected from uh, the, the wealth uh, of that region. And on the other hand, some regions that are performing much worse than would be expected from the socioeconomic background. So it does explain a lot of the variance, but still the outliers, I think, are very meaningful. If we try to explain why there are differences uh, between regions um, and, and we look at a number uh, of factors, we see that there are no differences whatsoever between the level of investment per student between regions and performance in PISA. Uh, this uh, lack of relationship um, is, is, is such, despite of the fact that some regions invest twice as much as others. So you have the Basque country uh, here, for example, investing much more uh, than, than other countries, uh, regions, sorry and still having uh, much lower levels of performance in, in PISA 2015. If you look at class size, again, uh, there are uh, differences. Uh, class size ranges between 20 students uh, and 28 students per class. And still there's no impact whatsoever of class size on, on student performance. Now, we do have one uh, type of assessment, which is not the same for all regions, but it's quite similar, which is the university entrance exam. And what's interesting is that it's partly designed and uh, the grades are given uh, by teams in which uh, teachers uh, from schools participate. It's, it's a university entrance exam, but it's designed and the grades are given by uh, teachers from, from schools. And here, what you can see clearly is uh, you have the top performers in PISA in the X axis, and in the Y axis, uh, you have the top performers in the university entrance exam. And what you get is an inverse relationship. So in those regions, uh, those regions that according to PISA, have a large share of top performing students uh, do worse in the university entrance exam. Um, and I think the only explanation for this is that the teachers are much more demanding because as I said, the exam is basically uh, the only common exam uh, that we have uh, for the whole of the country. So it seems to be the case that differences between regions do not have to do with levels of investment or other factors that are related to levels of investment, such as class size, but rather with the, how demanding the teachers are in the different regions. Now, what do uh, surveys fail to tell us uh, that it's important to know about the Spanish education system, particularly when you talk about equity and quality? Well, one of the major um, 
dramas, I would say, of the Spanish education system, uh, which you have in, in red and, and yellow, is uh, very high rates of early school leaving. Here we have uh, the rates for early school leaving comparing 2002 and 2011. As you can see, they are much, much higher than for the uh, other countries in the European Union. Um, in 2002, they were around 30%. By 2011, they had only gone down to 25%. Uh, this is much larger in both uh, years than for most countries in the European Union. But in the case of Portugal, for example, it was much higher in 2002, but it experienced a marked decline in 2011. So both high rates and the fact that they were stagnated uh, seem to be a major uh, problem in the Spanish education system. Now, they did start declining in 2011. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, a number of education reforms were approved, which uh, in summary, um, part of them uh, had to do with modernizing and making uh, vocational education and training more attractive and developing a new for a new model of dual vocational education and training and students started uh, increasing um, enrollment rates in in these new kinds of uh, vet and at the same time early school leaving declined. We can also see that during these uh, years between 2011 and 2015, when these reforms were implemented, the proportion of students that were in the grade uh, that they should be, that is, that did not repeat any grade, increased. So this is the same as saying that grade of rate, rate, grade of, the rate of grade repetition decreased. And here, what we can see again is that um, there is uh, a, an inverse relationship between the rate of early school leaving uh, between regions and uh, the proportion of students that are in the model grade. In other words, in those regions where great repetition rates are very high, you also have very high rates of early school leaving. Now, most of the students leave without even a lower secondary degree, the equivalent to GCSEs in, in the UK. They have really low levels of knowledge and skills. They've been repeating grades for many years and they face uh, really uh, high rates of an unemployment, which in 2012 were as high as over 50%. So between 2000 and 2011, uh, the rate of grade repetition was uh, stagnated and 40% of students repeated a grade at least once. This is the best proxy of early school leaving. As soon as a student starts repeating grades, it means that they're falling seriously behind. Uh, and um, it, there is a very high probability that those students are going to drop out of school. And as I said, without uh, the, the degree for low and lower secondary. And for decades, we've had rates of early school leaving being around 30%. So these are, very low skilled people, uh, young people leaving the education system and facing really high uh, levels of youth unemployment. So it's a very, very serious uh, issue with the education system that seems to exclude uh, at least one in, in every four students before the end of compulsory education. So the PISA conclusions are misleading in the sense that they do recognize that there, there is a high uh, rate of grade repetition, because as I said, they assess 15 year olds, irrespective of the grade in which they study. But what PISA claims is that grade repetition in itself lowers student performance and is costly and therefore it doesn't recommend it. But it doesn't seem to identify the causal factors that is that these students have been uh, struggling for many years that they've been lagging behind because there have been no assessments in primary that help uh, identify struggling students and give them the support that they need. And also there are no common targets between regions in Spain that students are meant to achieve at the end of educational stages. And therefore it's really up to uh, each school or each teacher in each classroom to decide what those targets are. 
Uh, so PISA fails, fails to make the link between early school leaving and, and great repetition, and therefore uh, in defining Spain as a country with high levels of equity, it misses a major source of inequality, such as great repetition leading to uh, high rates of early school leaving. So I conclude that PISA is wrong in concluding that Spain uh, has uh, sacrificed quality for the sake of equity because um, it's not an equitable system. So I'll just give a very brief summary of uh, you know, what kind of evaluations there are in Spain. Basically, Spain is rather unique, uh, at least in the OECD context, in that it's a country with no national assessments and no regional assessments with common st standards. Uh, some regions have evaluations, others do not. Uh, I will explain what the law says uh, about this, but most evaluations in those regions that decide to have them include only a sample of students and no link can be, can be established between uh, the results of these evaluations and individual students, teachers or schools, so there's no accountability. Why is this the case? Well, it's been the case for a long time. I think the reasons are very complex. On the one hand, regional government, regional governments uh, who are in charge of managing schools, but not in charge of defining the rules of the game through basic law, they reject national evaluations because they fear that it would be a form of re-centralization, uh, even though the education degrees are national. Uh, the unions reject student evaluations because they fear that this will lead to teacher blaming and they fear that it, it will be an indirect form of teacher evaluation. And some political parties on the left of the spectrum reject evaluations because they fear that they may discriminate against students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, which, as I showed, tend to have lower levels of performance. So. Uh, many people and many institutions uh, seems to seem to agree that evaluations are not a good idea, even though they lead to these uh, outcomes which uh, are very bad in terms of equity. Uh, you don't have to read the whole slide. Um, it, this is just uh, a, a very brief summary of what uh, basic law, which as I said, is defined by central government. Uh, says about uh, national evaluations and the summary that I'm going to give you is even shorter. So from 1990 until 2013, there were no national, uh, no external standardized national evaluations, nor were there any regional evaluations with common standards, because this is what basic law said, uh, that there should be no evaluations of this kind. And if regions wanted to implement evaluations, they could not be at the end of educational stages because uh, there was, again, a lot of fear about uh, evaluations having academic consequences. So, so they could only take place in intermediary grades. In 2013, uh, when I was part of government, we approved an education reform, which did include uh, external uh, national standardized evaluations. Um, but the rejection for all the reasons that I've mentioned led to such opposition that they were implemented uh, for three academic years in primary, but it never reached secondary, they stopped. And a new education reform is being approved right now uh, in parliament. And it goes further than the situation that we had in 1990. So it forbids uh, national evaluations. It forbids uh, regional evaluations for doing anything else, but uh, including a sample of students. It forbids uh, linking any results to students, teachers, or schools. And it goes further because um, even if teachers fail students, students will get a degree according to this new reform. And again, the justification for this is that uh, we should not discriminate against uh, students from low socioeconomic backgrounds. So even if the teachers feel that they should fail, they will get the national education degree. So my argument is, the fears around assessments leading to discrimination against students from uh, uh, disadvantaged backgrounds 
or teacher blaming have been so magnified in a country like Spain that they have been abolished. And one of the results of abolishing assessments is huge uh, regional disparities. And another one is uh, really high rates of uh, grade repetition linked to very high rates of early school leaving, which is in turn linked to very high uh, rates of youth, youth unemployment. So I, my main point here is that the fear of evaluations leading to some form of discrimination in fact, lead to the worst form of inequality that you can have in any education system, which is early school leaving. Now, I think I have the time, yeah, uh, to explain what happened in PISA 2018 and why uh, were the results for Spain withdrawn. So these are headlines from Spanish newspapers uh, questioning the reliability of PISA. Now, the results were withdrawn uh, before the launch in December, even though they had been sent uh, to all 17 regions after the summer, um, assuming that they complied with uh, the so-called PISA standards. Now, what happened is a number of regions detected uh, many problems with the data sets that they were sent. Uh, the, they felt uh, that uh, there were many errors and there were many unreliable um, uh, data in, in the data uh, sets. And therefore, uh, they asked uh, the OECD to fix them and the OECD withdrew the results for reading, which was the main domain in 2018, but did publish the results for maths and science. This led again um, to uh, lots of concerns because uh, in PISA, there is a substantial proportion of students that uh, all students have to take the main domain, which as I said, in PISA 2018 was reading, but there is a proportion of students that don't take either the maths or the science test, uh, those two domains which are not the main domain in that cycle. And what PISA does for those students is it extrapolates from the main domain. So in the case of 2018, students that had done the reading test, but uh, had not done the maths or science test still got a score which was extrapolated from, from the, the reading test. Now, uh, that's the reason why some regions felt that the results for uh, maths and science were contaminated and did not understand why they were published. In any case, uh, sorry, in any case, um, the results were published uh, in July, uh, but it was, it were th the same results that had been withdrawn in December. So uh, nothing had changed and still uh, PISA published the results. Now, what was the problem with uh, the reading domain in 2018? Well, uh, the, I think the problem has to do with the fact that, uh, I mean, this is these are my own conclusions. The OECD has given no explanation, so I cannot tell uh, whether the OECD agrees or disagrees uh, with uh, these conclusions. I left the OECD at the end of last year, and I was concerned about what had happened with Spain and had no information whatsoever. So this is research that I did um, on my own uh, when I uh, rejoined the Spanish Research Council. So my interpretation is, as I said in the very first slide, when I compare the different countries in the ranking, PISA is growing very rapidly, and most of the countries that have joined PISA in the last cycles are low middle income countries. Now, the problem that PISA had faced in previous cycles is that, as expected, these countries have very low levels of performance in PISA. Now, the problem was that uh, for governments in these countries to join PISA, only to be told that they have very low levels of performance wasn't good enough because uh, joining PISA and being exposed uh, to the fact that uh, the results show very poor levels of performance is very costly uh, for governments because uh, most people uh, don't understand the time lag, don't understand the fact that PISA uh, is a survey that assesses 15 year olds and therefore this is the results of many years in schooling. Rather, um, a lot of people and mostly the media 
uh, tend to focus on, you know, whichever government is in place um, to get the blame for the fact that the results are poor. So this was um, a very tricky issue because uh, PISA wants to expand even further, and still uh, the, the low and middle income countries that join only get a, a very poor uh, result and a very high political cost as a consequence. So um, my guess, this is, this is my argument, is uh, PISA tried to uh, include some items that had been developed for a different program, which was PISA for Development. PISA for Development was specifically designed for low-income uh, countries. And I won't go into the details unless you want to ask in the questions. So it did incorporate a number of elements from PISA for Development. And the most important one was the very first block, which was called Reading Fluency. Uh, but it was uh, a list of very short questions, which in my view didn't have anything to do with reading fluency. It was uh, questions like, are airplanes made of dogs? Yes or no. So this is grammatically correct, but it's nonsensical. So um, if I took the survey, I would be a bit confused. And apparently that is what happened in Spain and in many other countries. Students didn't know what to do with this new section on reading fluency. So what many students did was, uh, because this was a computer-based uh, survey, it had moved into computer-based uh, in the previous cycle in 2015, you couldn't move into the next sections unless you answer something. So a substantial proportion of the students just did what PISA uh, defines as straight lining. They just uh, clicked uh, yes or no for all the questions so that they could move on to the next one. This could have had more or less impact, but the, the problem is that the other major uh, change that PISA implemented is that it moved into what it calls an adaptive test. So uh, in previous cycles, all students did the same test irrespective of how they did in the first sections. In PISA 2018, this changed. So students were given tests of different levels of difficulty, depending on how they performed in the first sections. So my guess is that the combination of a first block on reading fluency that students clearly did not understand properly, plus the fact that PISA was um, designed in a different way as an adaptive test might have led to many of these students who um, clicked yes or no to all these uh, questions that they didn't understand to be given uh, for the rest of the test questions of higher or lower uh, difficulty depending on how they performed on that first section. So it did have major implications for how they were assessed for the rest uh, of the test. And this is something that uh, students did not understand at the time they were taking the test. As I explained, PISA did publish uh, the results in July. They were the same results that had been sent to the regions and later withdrawn for the launch in December. So uh, nothing was, was corrected or eliminated from, from the data sets. And the only explanation that PISA gave was that um, in Spain, students had a negative attitude towards PISA. It didn't, as I said, uh, that what I've just explained, it's my hypothesis. Uh, PISA has neither supported nor, nor denied it. Uh, so it claims that uh, students in Spain had a negative uh, disposition towards PISA uh, because uh, it claims that in, students in Spain had uh, high stakes exams uh, for 10th grade students earlier in the year than in the past. And because these exams were close to the PISA survey, then students had this uh, negative attitude. Um, this cannot possibly be the case. Uh, first, because as I explained, there's no such thing as high stakes exams in Spain. Second, because all the anomalies were concentrated on this first block on reading fluency. And then according to PISA, the, the students moved on to the next sections performing according to their level of proficiency. So why would they have a negative attitude only on a new block on reading fluency? 
which according to PISA is the easiest of all the survey, and then move on to the next and uh, respond according to their uh, true level of proficiency. Um, on top of that, as I said, uh, grade repetition is very high. This explanation would only apply to 10th grade students. And in PISA 2015, you only had 69% of students in 10th grade, which is the modal grade. You have 25% uh, of the students that have repeated one grade, and you have 6% of the students that have repeated uh, two grades. So any explanation that only applies to 10th grade students cannot explain the, the anomalies in, in, in the results because uh, compared to other countries, there are very few students in, in, in 10th grade. On top of that, as I explained, there are no high stakes exams and the exams that do take place in some regions only include a sample of students. Now, some of the regions that performed worst in PISA 2018 are regions that made sure that the sample of schools that were included in the regional diagnostic test were different from the sample of schools that were included in PISA. So if you add all these things up, it seems very unlikely that uh, any kind of exam in Spain would have led to this uh, bad negative disposition towards uh, PISA exam. So in, in my opinion, it uh, must have to do with uh, the methodological changes that uh, PISA in, included in 2018. And this leads to questions about the extent to which, in, in, to which international large surveys have to adapt uh, to uh, over time to the fact that education systems uh, are changing and to what extent do they have to remain consistent so that countries can uh, compare themselves over time and understand which policies have had a positive impact and which policies haven't. So to summarize, uh, if we look at the uh, PISA data for Spain and the conclusions and recommendations that it makes for Spain, PISA concludes that Spain is an education system which has prioritized equity over excellence. This does not take into account the fact that the high rates of great repetition that PISA does identify because it assesses 15 year olds in different grades lead to very high rates of early school leaving and that very high rates of early school leaving are the worst kind of inequity because they lead to high rates of youth unemployment and this students leave with such a low level of knowledge and skills that they face really high rates of unemployment for the rest of their lives. On top of that, regional disparities arise mainly as a consequence of lack of national evaluations and PISA makes no recommendations whatsoever uh, against uh, about whether Spain should or should not have uh, evaluations. It just warns again and again about the po uh, potential discriminatory impact upon uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds of high stakes exams, something that Spain has never had. So if you look at trends uh, over time, uh, PISA detects very few changes compared to other large international surveys like TIMS and, and PEARLS. A number of uh, researchers have pointed out that there were also some uh, major methodological changes in PISA 2015, and that since then, uh, PEARLS and TIMS detect uh, in some of the countries that participate in all these three surveys, uh, big improvements when PISA fails to detect uh, any change. So the, the question is, to what extent the surveys are measuring different things or to what extent uh, some of them are more sensitive to changes over time than others. And in this case, in particular, whether PISA has become less sensitive to detect changes over time since it started implemented, implementing these major methodological changes. So I've, I explained the situation for 2018, where the results for Spain were withdrawn. I am not aware, you know, there, there have been withdrawn for other countries like Vietnam and, and other countries. 
PISA does recognize uh, that this problem has affected uh, a percentage of students in, in other countries, but it hasn't given the information about how many uh, students and uh, the extent of, of the impact uh, of these changes. So uh, my argument is that rather than PISA trying to adapt to relevant changes in education systems over time, these methodological changes seem to do much more with the fact that the uh, countries that started participating in PISA in the last cycles are mostly low and middle income countries that have different needs. So these uh, changes that I've just mentioned were meant to make PISA much more sensitive at very low levels of performance. The problem is that it may be, at least that has been the case for Spain, that these uh, changes that were meant to make PISA much more sensitive at very low levels of student performance may have made uh, PISA less sensitive to changes uh, over time and um, to some unreliable results. And that's all, so I will stop sharing the screen in case you want to ask any questions. Thank you so much for that. That's absolutely fascinating. There are many, many questions I'd like to answer, uh, ask you if we, if we get enough time. Okay. Um, Monty, that was um, just such an excellent uh, outlay of everything that's been going on in Spain and the kinds of problems and the interaction between the Spanish policy system and OECD is absolutely fascinating. And you having worked in both of them, I, I was having many thoughts about how, how you managed to um, bridge those different uh, situations that you were working in. Yeah. We've got a couple of questions. Um, Victoria has asked, how do you think the results of PISA will be influenced by COVID? Okay. So, I mean, I do think international large scale surveys are really important. Uh, I mean, I obviously for a country like Spain with no national assessments, it's incredibly important, but for every country they're important because what we know from them, as I said at the beginning, is that differences in the quality of education systems are much, much larger than, than we expected. And it would be really important also to make use of these surveys to understand changes now. COVID has had a major impact on many education systems because as we all know, uh, particularly during the first lockdown, uh, schools closed uh, to different lengths in different countries. I think the exception is Sweden where schools never closed down, uh, but school closures um, led uh, to a, a lot of harm to the education system, but. Um, I'm particularly concerned uh, about students for, from disadvantaged backgrounds because I think there are enough data showing that um, they either did not have an internet connection or there were not enough um, devices at home for uh, each uh, child to be having uh, their, their own laptop or, or tablet or whatever. So there is enough evidence now showing that the impact was huge on students from disadvantaged backgrounds while students from advantaged backgrounds in most, at least most European OECD countries did manage to do most of the catching up. Um, I think it would be really important uh, to have PISA as soon as possible uh, in order to understand the extent of, of the impact. The problem is that uh, the next PISA cycle was going to take place in 2021. But because of the lockdowns and because of the complexity of the survey, it's been postponed at least until the next year, uh, 2022. So uh, we won't be getting any risk. If, if the survey can be conducted in 2022, then we won't be getting the results until 2023. All I'm saying is we need to do something about it before then um, because the kind of delay that uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds are suffering um, is so large that it's it's starting 
to be difficult to work out ways for them to catch up so that this delay doesn't affect them for the rest of their, their lives. Thank you. And I, I want to go on to the next question because um, I think it's, it's from our Director of Research, Sibyl Ergeron, and she's, uh, she's interested in science education. And so she's, she's asking about whether higher order thinking skills are reflected in uh, the science curriculum in all of the regions in Spain. And I guess this is partly uh, in relation to the findings that you showed where you don't have um, very high performers in your data. So I guess if, if PISA is assessing that, but the national curriculum doesn't teach that, maybe that's, that's why we're seeing a pattern of results like that. Yeah, so um, if you look specifically at complex problem solving, Spanish students are particularly bad at that. Um, so one, another objective of the education reform uh, that we, we implemented in 2013 was to try to move the education system away from what it was before, which was basically a, a system that was still very much focused on memorizing textbooks. Whether it was science or history or maths, it was still about memorizing textbooks. And you can see this very clearly when you look at the results for maths and science in particular, that any, any, any problem that can be solved by memorization, the, the students were doing, I mean, not very good, as you can tell, but okay. But when you look at complex problem solving, um, it, it, it was really bad. The, the, the level of performance of, of students was very bad. So, um, I mean, as we all understand, um, although I do think assessments are really important, uh, when, when you undertake an education reform, you have to put many different pieces of the puzzle together. So the education reform that was implemented in 2013, uh, that will be, uh, uh, stop now, uh, not only introduce the assessments, but also change the curricula and uh, define something that's new for the Spanish education system, which is evaluation standards, so that teachers and students could understand that memorization was no longer enough, that you really needed to get into complex problem solving and, and all these higher order skills uh, that um, teachers are, 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 are not teaching uh, in Spain at the moment. It's really um, fascinating to hear this. I, I want to ask you about um, the, the context of the system because uh, without the accountability measures, with your decentralization and your lack of standardization, you are so different from many of the neoliberal contexts in which we often discuss the effects of PISA. And I just wonder, um, given that sort of backlash against um, those things, standardization, centralization, and accountability, how, I mean, let's face it, Spain is not doing badly. They're scoring an average result like many of the big European countries. But how, how do you go about um, reforming a system that rejects those things when those are the standard answers that we have from OECD in particular, but um, from many reform movements, it's, it seems to me very challenging. Yeah. Um, so my, my personal experience when I was Secretary of State is um, I came from academia, so I spent most of my career in academia. So for me, having accountability in the system, having assessments uh, that uh, I understood as very powerful signals of what students should achieve, as we've just discussed, not just in terms of knowledge, but in terms of higher order skills and so on, was very important. And having them early on in primary was really important to identify struggling students. Um, it was... Um, a bit of a shock for me personally that the opposition to these uh, national assessments was so strong. Um, 
And I, 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 I tried to explain, you know, why there was a combination where regions are against it because they see it as an effort of national, by national government to centralize, which I don't share because as I explained, the degrees are national. So why would you give a national degree like GCSEs or A-levels if you don't have any kind of national standards, not just national assessments, but not national standards? Because um, I mean, the education system in Spain is quite unique in many ways uh, because in theory, decentralization by law is just, I mean, I'm not saying just you know trying to minimize or be derogatory but it's just about regions managing schools because the idea behind decentralization is that if you have management at the regional or local level you're going to be much more sensitive to local or regional needs and therefore the management is going to be much more effective but most uh, countries have decentralized their education systems with exceptions like france but they've made sure that there are accountability mechanisms just in case the new uh, level of government that starts making those decisions for whatever reason makes the wrong decision so that you know you can you can still evaluate whether those uh, that decentralized management is having a positive impact or not now in spain it's a bit more complicated, uh, but I try to focus on assessments in the talk because uh, the curriculum, it's also shared between central government and regions. So for every single subject, about 50% of the curriculum is decided by central government and 50% of the curriculum is decided by regions. So this makes any effort to have common standards even more complicated, right? So as part of the reform that we implemented, we also changed that. And following the example of other countries, what we did is for some core subjects, central government was defining the full curriculum and for other uh, topics, the regional governments were defining the curriculum. So we still re uh, respected the 50% balance but in a different way. The responsibilities were divided in a different way. And again, uh, some regions um, saw this as, as an effort to, by central government to centralize, uh, which is always, I think, an inflated fear. Like I'm, I've tried to explain that the fear of using assessments in a discriminatory way leads to abolishing assessments and then this leads to the worst form of inequity so sometimes the fear for potential risks uh, rather than making you think about how to design assessments or how to design responsibilities about curricula in a way that you avoid those uh, problems if you just abolish those measures then you end up with the worst result of all Thank you. I, I can't imagine how challenging it is to um, try and bring about a reform like that under those circumstances. But um, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time and I would really have enjoyed discussing this with you um, for much longer. I have many questions that I'd like to ask. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that under different circumstances. Sure, hopefully, yeah. That would be great. Um, but on behalf of uh, everyone, can I... Thank you. We can't do a round of applause, I don't think, on this system. Um, but I, can I thank you very much for a, an absolutely fascinating presentation. Um.